good morning. Thank you. I love the conversation that are, that's going on already. Hopefully you've met somebody you didn't meet before, and uh, hopefully through the rest of the morning you'll meet a few other folks. We feel like uh, one of the values of these particular events is the networking that can be done with one another. So make sure you make the effort to connect with somebody, if not during the session here, even during lunch when you head up to the dining center. My name's Ralph Gustafson. I've uh, had the privilege of serving here at Bethel for 22 years. My role is in church relations and seminary alumni. So I have the opportunity of finding ways that Bethel can be a resource to churches, help churches fulfill the mission of Jesus Christ. And uh, that's a blessing for me. So if there's any way that you can think of that your church, no matter what position you're in, could be served by Bethel, I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to talk to you this morning and find out ways that uh, we can make that happen. Uh, so welcome. It's, it's great to partner with Work With Purpose and also with all the various partnering ministries that we have along the back there. In addition to Church Relations, which has a table back there, uh, we have the Made to Flourish Network, which is back there, Thrive and Financial that's back there, McLaren CSF that's also there with some resources for you as well, and then Work With Purpose. So make sure during some of the breaks you check out uh, the resources they have and be sure to talk to some of those folks. They'd love to hear how they might be able to serve you as well. I also want you to know that we're going to be live streaming and recording these sessions. So keep that in mind. Uh, we, we're providing the live streaming for folks outside the St. Paul, Minneapolis area to be able to join us this morning. And then also it'll be available for those who may want to follow up on something uh, in recorded form. So be aware of that. If you start to cough a lot or something, you may want to slip on out for a minute or so. But we're glad to have you here. Pray that God will bless you in this time. And let me open our time with prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the chance to come together this morning as a part of your body, to be able to uh, see leaders in, in churches and in other ministries coming together for this time of teaching and equipping, Lord, is a blessing to us. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would fill this place in a, an incredible way. We thank you for bringing your servant, Tom Nelson, to be with us and his associate Tyler and we pray Lord that you would anoint him so that what he shares with us today would truly be from your lips to our hearts and minds that we might be more like your son Jesus Christ more like the kind of leaders in our churches that you desire us to be we thank you for Bethel Lord we thank you for the way in which you have used Bethel Seminary and the university to equip and train people to be Christ followers in the marketplace as well as in ministry. And we pray, God, that you would bless uh, this day as we spend it together. We ask this in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, thank you, Ralph. Uh, my name is Justin Irving, and I have the pleasure of serving as the director of Work With Purpose connected with uh, Bethel Seminary. And Work With Purpose is really focused on catalyzing conversations about faith, work, and economic integration uh, that are connected to what's happening in the seminary with our seminary students and faculty and staff, but also in the lives of, of churches and here in the Twin Cities. We want to see people who are taking seriously that work matters in the kingdom of God. It's estimated that we spend well over 100,000 hours of our lives invested in work, the day-to-day -day work of our lives. Well, I want to believe, and Bethel Seminary wants to believe, that that work matters to God, that it's worthy of our thinking about the theological foundations of why work is significant and how we can empower the people of our communities, the people of our churches, not just to live as disciples on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night, but to live as whole life disciples in everything that God calls them to invest in. So we're really glad that you're here. As uh, students, as faculty, as pastors, as community leaders, we're so thankful that you're here for this conversation. We have a lot to learn from Tom Nelson today, and in order to give a, a good, hearty introduction to Tom, we've invited Nathan Miller, who leads our uh, Made to Flourish network here in the Twin Cities. God is up to uh, powerful things in this conversation here in the Twin Cities, and Nathan is one of our partners in helping to catalyze that conversation. So Nathan, welcome, and we look forward to your uh, introducing Tom to us. Good morning. Good morning. 
I am very honored to be able to introduce uh, a colleague and friend, our speaker this morning, Dr. Tom Nelson. Uh, Dr. Tom Nelson is the senior pastor of Christ Community Church and the president of Made to Flourish, a pastor's network for the common good. Uh, he has been a member of the Board of Regents of Trinity International University and is also on the leadership team of the Oikonomia Network. Uh, he graduated with a Master of Theology from Dallas and received his doctorate from Trinity uh, Divinity School. Tom is the author of several books, including Five Smooth Stones, Discovering the Path to Wholeness of Soul, Ecclesia, Rediscovering God's Design for the Church, and Work Matters, Connecting Sunday Worship to Monday Work. Tom and Liz, his bride of 33 years, have made Kansas City their home since 1988. They have two grown children and a new pup, Harley. Please join me in giving Tom a warm Minnesota welcome. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, nice to be here with you. Thank you, Nathan, for that warm introduction, and uh, it's nice to be in the Twin Cities and at Bethel. Uh, I have uh, the great esteemed joy of telling you that I grew up in Minnesota. So uh, I'm a Minnesota boy and uh, grew up uh, about an hour north of here in a little one stoplight town called Malacca. Malacca, Minnesota, you may know where that is? Uh, so hey, you know? Uh, so it's uh, wonderful to be home uh, and thank you so much for the warm greeting and it's great to be with your team, Justin. What a delight. Tessa, you've been amazing. Uh, you know, everybody, everybody matters in their work, and Tessa has been extraordinary in serving us, hasn't she, Tyler? It's a, it's a, so thank you for your good work. All these come, things come together with lots of good details, so thank you. And Tyler, uh, I get to travel with Tyler, and Tyler's a, one of my colleagues at Christ Community in Kansas City. Uh, he's a pastoral resident. Uh, just like in a medical school, we have <laughs> students who come after their Master of Divinity and spend two years with us and teach us a lot about what it means to be a pastor in life. So, Thank you so much, Tyler. It's a delight to work with you and uh, a delight to be with you. So thank you for the whole Bethel team. All of you, Mark McCloskey is a friend of mine, and, uh, uh, and we've known each other for a long time, and he mentored me when I was a young lad, um, and so I'm grateful for Mark's uh, input in my life as well. But it's great to have you here. Thank you for carving out your precious time. And we pray that it be very valuable. You know, all of us, when we think about work, have a story that brings coherence about the work in which we do. Uh, that story might not be as articulated as uh, some, but all of us have a story in how we see work. And uh, one of those individuals is Woody Allen. And I want to begin uh, for you to listen to Woody Allen um, and his story of work. I think we got that. Fear <laughs> is what drives me. That, that um, if I stop working, you know, work is a wonderful distraction. And you get up in the morning and you think, can I get this actor? And what will I do with this costume and this location? The cameraman, I have to light it this way. And the script doesn't work. And many trivial problems that you solve. And if you don't solve them, nothing terrible happens to you. Just you have a bad movie, but nothing terrible happens. But if you don't have those problems, you sit home with nothing to do and you start to think about real problems. You start to think about, gee, I'm getting older, I could get Alzheimer's, I could get cancer, I could, my heart, how much longer can my heart go? What, what am I doing here? You know, life is short, it's terrible, it's meaningless, and you start to get, and then fortunately, when you work, that all gets put away. And so I work all the time out of desperation, out of fear to, you know, I finish a project, and I don't want time off. I want to go right into the next one so I don't have time to sit in a chair and, and think about what a terrible situation all human beings are in. <laughs> now, Woody Allen is a very brilliant person. And he's a very consistent atheist. Because all of us have a story of work. And an atheist story of work is exactly what Woody Allen is expressing. So I don't share his worldview, I hope you appreciate that, but I appreciate his consistency. Because all of us have an idea of what work is and its meaning in the world. And Wendell Berry, I think one of our finest American poets and writers, um, has said this, that the significance and ultimately the quality of work we do is determined by our understanding of the story 
in which we are taking part. All of us have a story that brings coherence to our life, or it seeks coherence in terms of what we do every day. Uh, I have had a story of work, and my story is a story of pastoral malpractice. Uh, I grew up in a wonderful Christian home. I came to faith in Jesus when I was young and uh, had a terrific family. I grew up and loved the Bible and studied the Bible much of my life. I uh, was involved with a wonderful parachurch organization called Crew for many years and went to Dallas Seminary and uh, was a pastor of a church. When Christ Community began, we moved to Kansas City with two of us in an apartment and began in church planting. So that's my background. About five years into my pastoral work, I began to realize that my thinking about work, and particularly my vocational work, was fundamentally impoverished. That my understanding of work itself, my understanding of my work, was fundamentally impoverished. Because out of an inadequate theology, I had an impoverished paradigm of what work meant for me and for those in my congregation. So I stood before my congregation one morning, and you could have heard a pin drop, because when pastors make a confession, you know, it's easy for the soul, but it's hard for pastors, right? Pastors are terrible at making confessions. Uh, you could have heard a pin drop, because most of the time, our confessions tragically are around moral indiscretions or financial malfeasance. But for me, I had to come to the place where I had to communicate to the congregation that I had been inadequately equipping them for life, that I had been committing pastoral malpractice. And by God's grace, our congregation was gracious to me to say, we know you have an important calling. It's not the only calling. It's not necessarily the most important calling. It's a very important calling, and that's to equip us to be the people God has called us to be in the world and to communicate that the gospel speaks to every nook and cranny of life. And pastor, we will give you the benefit of the doubt that you've had an inadequate theology, you are the one who is called to study the scripture and know it, and you have been inadequate in explaining and understanding it yourself. Now again, I've had a lot of background in the Bible, and all of us have an opportunity to learn and unlearn. And Abraham Heschel, a great Jewish rabbi, said this, and I think this is really true in my own life and my story, is that one of the most great, or the greatest perils in life is the challenge that we often see what we know rather than know what we see. The tendency for all of us is to already think we know what the Bible says. And so we come to it, and our story of work is impoverished because we don't see really what is there. Okay, So I've had the delight of making a lot of changes and rethinking out of a theological conviction of what pastoral ministry is and what the importance of the church is in the world based on that. So where I'd like to go is to realize, to communicate to you that my malpractice was really this. It was, I was addressing people's minority of their life. I call it the minority-majority disparity. In other words, as a pastor, I was equipping people for the minority slice of their life and not the majority of their life. Uh, I was very committed to the scriptures, to teach the scriptures, committed to be the church God had called us to be, but because of an impoverished theological paradigm and a pastoral paradigm, my congregation was not flourishing in its mission and its formation because I was spending more time thinking about people on Sunday morning than on Monday morning. Uh, and th this is not uncommon for many of us in the clergy. Some of you are in the clergy, some of you are not. But this is a rampant issue there is a massive Sunday to Monday gap, not only in the pews or the chairs on Sunday morning, but the greatest Sunday to Monday gap is in the pulpits of America. So this is where I found myself, and I thought I was alone. <laughs> I thought I was just the one that was making all the mistakes. Uh, and then over the years, I began to realize that this is a common and tragic problem where the church is not flourishing and where people are not being spiritually formed, and where many congregants feel like second-class citizens in their churches, and the churches don't get it. I could tell you uh, hundreds and hundreds of times, with no exaggeration, we're business and marketplace leaders, people of very thought and congregation will come in and say, my pastor doesn't get it, Tom. They don't, they don't get it, okay? So I'm, I'm, I've been there, and part of my goal is to help make a difference in that. So how do we begin to narrow the Sunday to Monday gap? 
this, this is very perilous. Haddon Robinson has said, a wonderful theologian, has said that the greatest heresy of the 20th century is the sacred-secular divide. So many of us have a very dualistic or bifurcated or compartmentalized view of the world, that there's the spiritual, there's the, there's the physical, there's the temporal, there's the eternal, there's Sunday life, and there's Monday life. And the two never come together. I'll give you an example. I was at a uh, philanthropy for prenatal care in Haiti. And uh, Sunday evening, my wife has never met a stranger, and I'm an introvert, and Sunday, and I've already talked a lot, and we go to this beautiful French restaurant in Kansas City. <laughs> Amazing. And it's a philanthropy to raise this money for prenatal care. And the who's who of Kansas City is there, and I'm a who's that, right? I mean, that's just, and I like that. I like being that. So we're sitting at a table, and we're introduced, and the lady across the table, um, I know her, she doesn't attend Christ Community, but she's a very wise executive, a, a remarkable woman, a wonderful philanthropist in Kansas City. She's the who's who. And I've met her on different occasions. She grew up in a Christian church, and she, uh, as we were going around, she outed me. Okay? Pastors hate to be outed on a Sunday night, particularly among strangers. And after she introduced herself, true story, she, we're right on this table, just like this, and she looked across the table, lowered her bifocal, she said, Pastor Tom, Right there, I'm outed, right? Nobody knows I'm a pastor. She said, I heard you wrote a book about work, and she didn't pause. She said, why on earth would a pastor do that? And then, you know, I chuckled a little bit. I'm not good on my feet, like, yeah, pastors only work one day a week, and, you know, things like that. But she basically was saying to me, and she said, you know, you have no idea of my world, and I have no idea of your world, and that's just the way it is. But many, many people understand their clergy are completely out of touch with their life. Or they might talk about their marriage or their single life or their sex life or something in a, in a confidential way, but the, where they spend the majority of their life, there's just this massive disconnect. Massive disconnect. And she's not unusual. She's a bright, thoughtful woman who does not see the church in her world of work and investments as having any connection. Her faith and her work have no connection at all. Okay? This is just common across the country. Common across the country. So what we're trying to do, and what I'd like to unpack for us this morning a little bit, is because how do we narrow it? And one of the conversations around the country across tribes is we call it the FWE conversation, that how do we bring faith, work, and the economy together in an integrated approach? And faith, work, and economic integration is really about not adding another thing to our lives, not a new program uh, in a local church or in our context. It's really about a coherent theological vision. It's about seeing what the Bible teaches from Genesis to Revelation. We're going to touch on that in a minute. It's about a pastoral paradigm shift. It's about addressing our, many of us, our impoverished understanding of what it means to be a faithful clergy person and a fruitful one. And it's also the daily cultivation of a flourishing local church culture. We're not just talking about uh, a program. We're talking about a different kind of flourishing local church culture that is theologically rich, gospel-centered, and powerfully transforming. And the last 15 to 20 years in a wonderful church I serve, I have seen a massive difference. I talk about this in Work Matters a little bit, about what it was like when I lived in a, in a home for a while with the same old kitchen. And my wife wanted to change the kitchen. I'm thinking, what's wrong with the kitchen? It works great. I had no idea. Once she designed the kitchen and we had our contractors, and when it was done, you know, I can never imagine going back to the old kitchen. Nor will I invite people into that old kitchen. But that's all I knew. And many of our church contexts and clergy contexts are like the old kitchen. We don't know anything different. We've never seen the brilliance and beauty of a whole new way of seeing the world and the church based on theological conviction of the text. It's like many of us are living in an old kitchen rather than the new kitchen that's for us. And the new kitchen is beautiful in its beauty and effective in its mission. The last 15 to 20 years at Christ Community has been massively different. It's more effective in its mission as a church in the world, in our city, and more beautiful in expression, and both of them matter to God. So I'd like to just you know, challenge us with some thinking. Wherever we are in our vocation, if we're clergy or, or a, a Christian leader, how do we begin to address this perilous Sunday to Monday gap? And it is true across religious tribes of America. How do we begin to do it? Well, I want to suggest for your consideration, kind of the scaffolding of my conversation this morning, uh, is three essential threads in the fabric of a new kind of vibrant culture in a local church. Three essential threads, and I'm going to focus most on the first one because it matters so much at first. So that's where I'd like to go this morning. First of all, 
It is really important that we teach a robust theology of work and vocation. Vocation is a broader idea, but work is a central theme in vocation, which means calling. We need to teach a robust theology from cradle to grave in all dimensions of human development. In Sunday morning, we'll talk about that. In discipleship, all that we do, we need to teach a robust theology of work. So how do we begin to do that? Well, it's really important for us to begin where the Bible begins. Um, For me, one of the big changes was when I began to really look carefully at the bookends of Scripture. Because as followers of Jesus, we know the Bible matters, and it matters from Genesis to Revelation. Every bit of it, Jesus says, every jot and tittle, which is an Old Testament Hebrew idea of little pieces of one letter, right? Every bit of that Bible matters. It speaks into all of life. The gospel not only transforms our life inwardly, it transforms how we see in the world, how we live in the world, how we work in the world. It's not only just what we're saved from, it's what we're saved for. So if we begin to see what the Bible teaches from Genesis to Revelation, it profoundly introduces us that work is at the very heart of the story. It's not an add-on. Work is a central thread in the biblical story. And what does it mean to be made in God's image? And what does it mean to be involved with God's mission in the world? His imago Dei, image of God, and missio Dei, his mission in the world. So I'd like to just take a, a, a little bit of time this morning and begin where the Bible begins, because it's like a movie or a book, right? One of the things I hate, if you want to see Pastor Tom get carnal, and I have my moments, okay, is to get late to a movie, right? Because if I get late to a movie, I'm lost. I mean, I've got to see how it begins. Sure, I want to see how it ends, and all in between for the richness of the story, but if I miss the opening, I'm lost. The opening matters. So when we talk about a robust theology of of work and the importance of work, we need to start at the beginning. So what I'd like to do is to take just a few minutes and focus on the opening of the Bible. Because the danger, again, is many of us, right, instead of knowing what we see, we see what we already know. It's the danger of familiarity. Like, I have a three-minute commute from one of my offices to my home. And I take this all the time. And if you were to ask me, what did you see Sunday morning when you drove to your office? I'd go, oh, there was a railroad track. I can't remember anything I saw, because I do it all the time. I don't really see where I am, because it's so, quote, familiar. I already know where I am, or do I? So when we enter the scripture, I'd like to just begin where the Bible begins, okay? Just a, a, a summary of this. First of all, In Genesis chapter 1, if you have a Bible open or you have it with you, you can follow along if you want, but just let's begin a little bit with this. In Genesis chapter 1, God introduces himself in a particular way. From general revelation in Psalm 19 of all of creation, now to specific revelation where God uses human speech to reveal his, his person to the world. The Bible does not begin with any proposition proving God. That's a self existent reality, that's axiomatic. What God does is he introduces himself to who he is that nature cannot say, right? That's general revelation. So in the beginning, what? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This verb, create, bara, shows God revealing himself as a worker. And he can reveal himself in any way first, who I am, right? Brilliant, intelligent, creative, the triune God, relationship, intimacy, all aspects. I mean, God is vast in his attributes. He introduces himself as a worker first. Must not miss that. So we go through Genesis chapter 1, we see God as a worker, and we uh, understand in Genesis 1 the development of creation, and God says it, and it's so, and there are these days, that's the structure. Well, when we come to verses 26 to 28, we see a difference, and now humans are made in God's image, male and female they're made, right? There's a uniqueness, and we know image, this is the Hebrew word salem, It has both a sense of connection and reflection. This is the two meanings, primary meanings. It's connection with God, it's intimacy relationship, and it's reflecting his image. So humans are made in God's image. What do we know already in the the Genesis story? That when we reflect God, we reflect him in our work. That's where God has introduced himself up to this point. Now, when we get to the cultural mandate, that's a theological term. Some of you are trained that way, some of you maybe not. But in verse 28, you'll notice in Genesis 1, there are five Hebrew imperatives. This is very rare in Torah, or instruction, foundation of the Old Testament in Hebrew. 
God introduces himself and he blesses his, his special creation of humanity, right? And God blesses them. And if you want just a little background here, you have uh, the Hebrew language is, is written to be heard, and there's all kinds of beautiful poetry in called Hebrew assonance, consonantal, consonantal assonance. So you have bara, bara. Barak is the word bless. So you hear bara, God created, and then bara, God blessed. You hear it? So you, if you hear it read in Hebrew, bara, bara, now you hear para. So you hear bara, bara, para, and these are all connected together. Para is the first imperative on be fruitful. So it says be fruitful, multiply, Fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion. These are five imperatives. Think of them as like a locomotive a train. Para is the strongest bearing weight of the five imperatives. It's very rare in Hebrew. So this is the cultural uh, mandate. Be fruitful. And then what that means is elaborated by the other imperatives and the rest of the narrative in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. So this idea of be fruitful is very important. If we miss what this means, then we miss a fundamental aspect of the story. This word para, fruitful in English, has two main meanings. First, procreativity, in other words, having babies, reproduction, but also productivity. And this is what is often missed in the Torah, first five books of the Old Testament. This word is used to describe the fruitfulness of the land, fruitfulness of cattle, productivity, as well as babies. Okay? So often we come into Genesis 1 and 2, and we go right to the end of Genesis 2, and we're thinking it's all about marriage and babies. It's not. The primary thrust of Genesis 1 and 2 is not about marriage and babies. It's about work. So let me follow through with the flow of what the text says. So humans are made in God's image, and they reflect God fundamentally in many ways. But in the narrative, up to this point in the text, it's their work. Now, we see that elaborated more in Genesis chapter 2. If you have your Bible or you're following along listening, Genesis 2 zeroes closer in on how humans fit in the created order. So what you have in Genesis chapter 2 is you have this picture of incompletion. And you'll notice, if you have your text open, verses 5 and following, you have three negations. There's no bush or no plant, no rain, and no man. So there's a negation. It's not ready yet. It's not God saying, oops. It's like humans fit integrally into all of creation. So God responds as the master architect, addresses these three negations, no plant, no rain, no man, and he, he cultivates the land, he brings rain or, or water from the earth, and he creates a human. Okay, do you see how his architecture is unfolding there? When we get to verse 15, this is very, very important because it is the central job description of humanity. Central job description of humanity. So it says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden. Notice two, these are two Hebrew infinitives, to work it and to keep it. And this idea of work is the Hebrew word avodah, uh, the ending is the infinitive ending. And it's used throughout the Old Testament to describe, in a seamless way, work and worship. There was no Sunday to Monday gap in original creation. Work and worship were seamless. We don't worship our work, but work was a fundamental aspect of worshiping God before sin and death entered the world. This Hebrew infinitive is used of the priest in the tabernacle doing priestly things, the farmer in the field. So work and worship was one. It was a seamless fabric that reflected God's image bearing this in humanity. Make sense? So you have this picture of how work, I mean, work is a central thread in the creator order. To be human is to work. It's more than that. And this is why Rabbi Paul, because the Apostle Paul will say to the Thessalonians, imagine this, the Apostle Paul who cared for the poor and collected for the poor and cared deeply for the poor says to the Thessalonians and the second Thessalonians, if someone's not willing to work, they should not eat. Rabbi Paul knew his Torah. To be unwilling to work is to, I won't use this crass terminology, it's to basically reject God and how we're wired, how we're designed. It's that central in the creator order. Now, let's real quickly get to the massive dissonance in chapter 2 and verse 18. Remember in, in chapter 1, you hear it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. Every day, and then the sixth day, it's toad mode. It's very good. So God goes, yep, this is great. Now, we get to Genesis 2, before sin and death enter the world, and all of a sudden in the narrative, we have a chalkboard moment. <laughs> it's a literary chalkboard moment. Like a, you know, in the old days, the teacher writing on the board, I don't know if we do that anymore, but squeak, you know, and everyone wakes up in history class. That's it. It's a literary device, and what we have in 18 is God says, it's not good for man to be alone. He's not saying, oops, I made a mistake in creation. 
So what does God say? I will make Adam a helper. The Hebrew word is ezer. And here you have a wonderful translation from ancient Hebrew to English, because helper is a really good translation. And the question in the narrative is not a helper for who, it's a helper for what. Because all the way up to this point, until the end of the chapter 2, it's about work. Everything is about work. The animals are paraded in front of Adam, not just because Adam doesn't want to sleep with the animals, I hope, but the job description in 2.15 is so massive that no animal can help him do this, to cultivate and keep the garden. He needs a helper to do the work. Okay? And we can unpack all what that means in terms of a theology of singleness and the importance of singleness. Marriage is important, but it comes at the very end, and marriage is this culmination of para, of both productivity and procreativity. Work, I'm saying, without going into more details for time, is a central thread. And what we see in Genesis 3 is what? The immediate corruption of this integral design. What's immediately corrupted? Para is. Fruitfulness is corrupted by sin. Both in procreativity and productivity. Remember, what are the two signs of the curse in Genesis 3? This is why it's, the Torah is coherent. Pain in childbirth addresses the procreative aspect of para. But there's also thorns and thistles. Do you follow me? And that's why para is disintegrated, this idea of fruitfulness. So I'm saying we could just begin to look. When you look at what the text teaches, we see the central thread of being made in God's image. A central thread is work. Work is not an addendum. It's not a fad. It's at the very heart of our story. And there is no Sunday to Monday gap before sin and death enter the world. And when you follow the story, as we get to Christ, the prophets, wisdom, for example, Proverbs. Let me just tell you quick. Do you realize that Proverbs, the brilliance of Proverbs, brings all of life together in the personification of wisdom? And it ends in 31, and it ends with the model person of para, of fruitfulness, of wisdom. Who is that? Not a priest or a king, it's a woman. An industrious woman. The epitome of Proverbs is a woman of productivity and commerce. Yes, she cares for her family. In this case, she has children. But the focus of wisdom in all of Proverbs, it talks about uh, work and all aspects of a wise life. It presses into God's design. Can you believe it is a virtuous woman, is the personification in her industry and her work as the ultimate person of wisdom? And you go through the New Testament, and the importance of work is all the way through it, all the way to the very end. So what we're just saying is that we need to teach a robust theology of work that permeates our discipleship curriculum, our preaching, because we're not forcing into the text. We're just seeing how central work is. Now, let's remember, work is defined biblically not as compensation, but contribution. So all of us are created to work from cradle to grave, whatever stage of life, underemployed, unemployed, stay-at-home spouse, retiree, all of us were created to contribute from cradle to grave. As a student, that is our vocation to study, right? So you see how if we have a rich theology of work, it speaks profoundly to all of life and to every section of Scripture. This is not forcing something. This is not some new fad. The Reformers saw this. The early church fathers saw this. The centrality of work. And the gospel, when we're redeemed in Christ, profoundly changed that, okay? A couple of examples in the New Testament. We could go a long time here, but I want to move on. But here's an example. When we look at Jesus, okay, here's, let me just share two paintings from the 17th century, one Spanish and one French. When we have an image of Jesus, most of us probably think of this. It's called Christ Crucified. It's a famous painting by a Spanish painter, Degas, 17th century. And again, not to diminish this at all, it's very important because Jesus came ultimately to the cross. His ultimate mission to save the world and to what? Redeem tapanta, all things, not just human souls. Otherwise, the Bible is completely incoherent in multiple ways, not to diminish souls. But we don't think about this picture of another 17th century painter called St. Joseph the Carpenter. And it's a little hard maybe to see here, but you have this picture of young Jesus with his human guardian father in the carpentry shop in Nazareth and learning from Joseph. And this is really important for us to grasp, that the hidden years of Jesus are vital. Jesus spent the vast majority of his time on planet Earth as the Son of God, 
not as an itinerant rabbi, that was only three years, the vast majority of his time, and from 12 on, we know this from Luke chapter 2 and Mark, Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, on his mission to restore the world, the vast majority of his time he spent working with his hands and running a small business. What does that say in our story? That says a lot. And most of the time, the story we hear often, in a pulpit or other places, there's no place for the hidden years. It doesn't make sense. If, if souls are all that matter, right, and the Bible's the only thing that ever lasts forever, then for God, who's brilliant, omniscient, for him to send his son, and his son to spend 20, well, 30 years, but it's from 12 on, in a carpet shop in remote Nazareth, not preaching the kingdom, there's something wrong with that. That doesn't make sense. But it makes a lot of sense if we understand our whole story. Why work matters and why Jesus incarnated that in multiple ways. Okay? So we need to teach a robust theology from creation to consummation, from Genesis to Revelation. A wonderful resource is the Theology of Work Projects. I want to encourage that. It's a group of scholars the last 50, 10 years who have created commentaries for every book in the Bible, theologyofwork.org, I think it is. Um, and if you're a teacher or just interested in reading, every text of scripture is dealt with in terms of the theme of work. You will be stunned how central work is. Okay? So we need to teach a theology from this text that helps inform people about the importance of work. We also need to not only connect Sunday to Monday, we need to bring Monday back into Sunday. And this is really important in the Made the Flourish network. It's important across the country. For those of us who are responsible, and as elder leaders or bishops or clergy or people who care about our local church and giving leadership in some way, it's not only that we want to help equip people for Monday. We want to bring Monday back into Sunday. And it's really important that we think through a rich theology of faith and work on a Sunday morning. What does that look like? It profoundly changes language, profoundly changes preaching, profoundly changes hymnody, profoundly changes interviews, or we call them vocational interviews, benedictions, profoundly changes how we, in our liturgical context, whatever it is, how it changes. And uh, this is very, very common. We also need to embrace, and I'm going to touch on this, pastoral practices that applaud work. Uh, not only inform work and affirm people's work, but applaud. Because what we celebrate as a faith community is what we value. And some of the things that are really important here is that if a pastor or clergy or leader of a church has a different paradigm based on the text and theology and connecting Sunday to Monday and seeing a primary work of the church as a church at work, then pastoral leadership, or you could say congregational leadership, is going to change their practices. I mean, just one example. When I first started as a pastor, before when I was committing pastoral malpractice, I visited parishioners in a hospital. I still do on a selective basis. I have to for time. But I never imagined the importance of visiting my parishioners at work. And let me just give you a couple examples. The last 15 to 20 years at Christ Community, this is very common. Here's one of my parishioners. David Greisel is a world-class architect. And here he is uh, giving a tour of PNC Park in Pittsburgh. And I was a part of a group uh, meeting there with leaders. Uh, and Dave is an architect. He was an elder of our church for a while, an elder. He's a congregant member, has his own firm. But he builds beautiful stadiums. David has a deep understanding of the theology of work and the importance of it. Okay? But this is my workplace visit on one day in Pittsburgh. Okay? And I'm in Kansas City. Here's another one. Here's Matt Ernest. Matt Ernest is a top-notch cardio surgeon. And he teaches at a teaching hospital called the University of Kansas Medical Center. And it's a fun story because he came to our church. He's really pretty new to our church. And he's a part of our leadership curriculum called Razor's Edge. Um, and I met he and his wife, Melissa. And at the door one Sunday, I just not remember very long, I met him at this leadership course that we teach. Uh, I said, Matt because he had said he was a, what he did. I said, anyway, hey, I could come to your work. And he was like, whoa, you know? Later he told me he was scared spitless, but he set it up. <laughs> he set it up. Imagine how amazing it was for me to learn and to be on his turf. To go to the University of Kansas Teaching Hospital, this brilliant medical center, this brilliant guy who has fellows from all over the world, residents all around him, his whole team as they do their work, right? He calls himself a high-tech plumber. Right? And he is. But imagine me scrubbing up with them 
meeting his team, and, and he was brave enough to introduce me as his pastor. Some people don't, which is fine. But I had four hours. I didn't faint. That was the biggest thing. <laughs> but imagine the transformation in my relationship with Matt and Melissa. Yes, we will talk about areas of their family, their kids, marriage, issues that any pastor would talk about. But now I have a whole new dimension to his work and the importance of it. Our relationship is much more significant. I pray differently. I preach differently. I love differently. I serve differently because I know his world. And he sees me differently. That's just one example of praxis that changes if we are serious about being faithful in our vocation to equip people for all of life. The gospel speaks to every dimension of human reality. It's the, the catalyst for human flourishing. Okay? So uh, I think it's really important to grasp that. And so what I've tried to say in an introductory level is that many of us have a Sunday to Monday gap in our thinking. And the quality of our work and our meaning of our work, you know, Viktor Frankl, I think, wrote the best book in the 20th century, Man's Search for Meaning. Viktor Frankl was Jewish. He knew the Torah. He knew the Old Testament. He was a Swiss psychiatrist. He was a Holocaust survivor. Maybe you've read Man's Search for Meaning. I think it's one of the most brilliant books written in the 20th century. But Viktor Frankl said that we search for meaning. We are meaning-seeking creatures. All of us are, regardless of our worldview. And he said we find meaning in two areas. Where do you think he found it? <laughs> in the relationships we have and the work we do. Does that sound like Genesis 1 and 2? You bet. So we want to begin to think about how do we connect Sunday to Monday? And there is a perilous gap. What does it mean in terms of teaching theology in all dimensions of discipleship and mission? What does it mean in terms of liturgy? And when we gather, are the gathered church before we become the scattered church? And what does it mean for pastoral praxis? I want to uh, show you uh, a video now of what it looks like for a younger pastor at Christ Community who's been swimming in this water for a long time. Okay, I'm not saying Christ community is the best thing, but give you a picture of the difference. Here's Reed Kappel telling his story. He was a student ministry pastor, now he's preaching at one of our campuses. His story, uh, and you get to see what, how he sees his world, his pastoral world differently as he talks about it. I think we're set to go. Okay, right here. This is made to first, I'll, I'll skip over that. On Saturday, have. October 11th, 2014, uh, I was flying from New York to Charlotte, uh, as a connecting flight back to Kansas City. I was returning from a conference with two of my friends, colleagues, and, and as we were, we were up in the air, um, we noticed that there was a drop in, in uh, temperature in our, in our plane. And it was a little bit alarming, but we're like, oh, no big deal, and I was kind of dozing off. But then our, we started to notice our, our plane dropping in altitude rather quickly. There's a little bit of panic, I'm awake now, and then the panic increased when the oxygen masks deployed from, from above us. I looked at my friend Chris, who's sitting next to me, and we were pretty shocked, but we just put our, our masks on and, and prepared for what was next. We had no idea what it was. No one was telling us what was going on, and the plane started to go down even faster. And in this moment, I, I was honestly reflecting on the fact that this might, this is, this is it. That was a moment of thinking, I am near death. And I got my phone out and began crafting a text message to my wife and my three daughters letting them know that I love them, that I'm thinking about them, and that, that I'm on a plane, that we're going down. And a few minutes later, the captain came on and notified us that we had lost cabin pressure, uh, that everything else was functioning fine, that we just needed to drop to 10,000 feet uh, so that we could breathe properly. And so obviously, we can now kind of take a big sigh of relief. Um, we can take the oxygen masks off, but, but it was very much a scary moment. Um, and as my friend Chris and I were talking and reflecting and processing about what just happened, we noticed that as these oxygen masks are still dangling in front of us, that on the side of, of the little bag says Lenexa, Kansas, which is a suburb of, of our hometown. And I kind of made a note of that. I was like, that's interesting that this company in my backyard made, made this device that really helped us. Uh, but it wasn't until about a few months later where our church, uh, we were going through a, a sermon series on faith, work, and, and economics of all things. And it was during that series that I think the Lord was, was doing something in my heart and mind by granting me this kind of imagination for the way in which the work of literally millions of people uh, serves to bless me and make my life better. And, and I, I just started to sit at my desk and look at all the things that makes my life easy, that allows me to do my work well. I was immediately reminded of the oxygen mask. So I got on online and, and just searched for oxygen mask, Lenexa, Kansas. 
And what popped up was BE Aerospace. And I looked at their website and I didn't even have really a plan. I was just, I was just kind of responding. And I, I went and found a, a contact and sent an email and shared the story of the oxygen mask and our, our flight. And, and, and as I'm sharing the story, I, I, I decided to also just share why I wanted to express my gratitude because I saw a connection between the way in which we work and how that blesses and serves our neighbors. And so in the end of that email, I, I said this, if I may be so bold, I'd like to thank God for the work that he has called and equipped your company to do. I know that not many people think of work like this as being work God cares about, but I strongly beg to differ. I believe that God cares deeply about all work that is done well and promotes human flourishing. So again, thank you for your work. And please, by all means, keep doing what you're doing and do it well for the common good of all. When I got the email, I said, well, you know, our people work here every day. They know we provide or we produce uh, life support systems, yeah? I always emphasize with my people that uh, uh, the products we make here are designed and used to save people's lives and that it is very important that they produce very high quality product and that uh, for doing that or in doing that, that they follow all the procedures, the work instructions. And I thought it would be a very good message for them to hear it from someone other than their boss, yeah. When Reed came, we had the all hands meeting and uh, it was a, uh, really a fantastic experience because there was probably very few dry eyes, I would say, in the room. And to see that uh, what they are doing every day impacted a person and his family and a lot of other person, you know, around it on the aircraft was really something that uh, impacted the people here. It really did. And there were people that came up to me crying and telling me how meaningful it was. No one has ever taken the time to express gratitude for our work. And I was so amazed by that, and it led me to think, gosh, how significant it is for us to pause, to th thank people specifically for their work, to not just make them feel better about what they do, but to also give them a more robust imagination for the fact that God is at work in our world through our work, and that God cares about our work because our work is a means by which we love and serve our neighbors for the good of all people and the glory of his name. So at Made to Flourish, which we're a new organization, and it's not about Made to Flourish, but we do have a dream. That more and more pastors would embrace the rich theology of scripture and equip people for the majority of their life like Reed. I couldn't have imagined, you know, 28 years ago when I became a pastor, this kind of vocational faithfulness and spiritual formation. And we wanted to kind of give you a picture of what we hope God will do in our congregations across our nation and made to flourish. So let's take a break now. We're gonna chat a little bit around the table. Uh, and we'd like to have you just for like 10 minutes, maybe there's one, th one thing uh, that you would wanna take away. Like one thing that, hey, I wanna think about this more or that grabbed me or maybe there's a sense of a pushback, okay? So just take 10 minutes. Uh, let's say what's the one thing that's sort of a takeaway or like, hmm, uh, that you've kind of been processing as you've listened. So thanks again for your good listening, okay? And then we'll draw you back for Q&A time. 